Hi, welcome to The Church Split. My name is Will, and let's talk about a topic that splits churches, which is resigning the faith. Today, I want to talk about Hawk Nelson's John Steingard, who has said he no longer believes in God. So, another one bites the dust, right? This is just another, another evidence of another artist, another musician who just drops out of the faith. And this happens all the time. That's why it's just, it's, I don't mean to make light of it when I say like another one bites the dust, but it's true. We just keep seeing this. It's, it's like an ongoing thing. So before I jump into reading through, I want to just take time to read through it and comment on it as I go. But uh, I did get a new mic. This one has been brought to us truly by Brian. It is a directional mic, so it's supposed to not pick up sound from over here, but all from right here, which will, should, if everything goes well with my testing, should really reduce any echoing that we've had in the past. If not, I only have one, about one or two more options, and then you guys are just stuck with a slightly echoey audio. But anyway, um, let's just jump into this now. I hope this can be helpful for you. I've seen a few other channels already talk about it, but this is, first things first is that I want to address the fact that this is happening regularly and this is why it's important that you don't always just take musicians or even people as your primary theology. You cannot be, we shouldn't be looking to the, to just musicians as anything besides, you know, Christian musicians. They're not lead theolog theologians. They're not these, you know, PhD philosophers typically. These are just musicians. These are people. This is, uh, this has been going on for a very long time. And that's why it's important that Christians guard their faith and are careful on who influences them. Now I can already see the CCM naysayers already seeing like, yep, see, there goes another one just biting the dust. And you know, and you guys are over there still in your CCM world. But the problem is this shows the fact that in many ways, the Christian music scene is just that. It's another music scene. It's, it's just a machine of just product after product after product. It's a real pet peeve of mine in general, where as opposed to trying to produce a lot of depth, I mean, their song Drops in the Ocean, uh, Hawk Nelson's is actually pretty good. Uh, but instead of developing depth, they're just trying to drop out the new album and go down the next tour. And that's why I think a lot of these musician, musicians drop out, because they're pretty much surrounded by only other musicians. And then the speakers at a lot of these things are, you know, maybe a good preacher, or they might be somebody who can present a fun way to give the gospel. There's one I, I was at, I think, Winter Jam, and one guy gave the gospel on a skateboard. And he was like, yeah, look, I'm giving the gospel on a skateboard. And he thought it was like, it was really cool. And I cringed the entire time because I was going, man, it, you know, we have a packed stadium in here. This would be a good time to get somebody out with a really solid gospel presentation, someone who is an apologist, somebody who can just drive this home. And instead, it kind of was this cheesy way of going about it. And it's and that's why Christians, first things first, we have got to take our gospel a little bit more seriously. We have to be better at defending it. And that's what I'm going to do a little bit today. I'm going to just go through what he said, and we're going to talk about it. And I'm just going to comment on it as we go. It is his own personal story, so there's a lot of story elements in here, but bear with me as we go, okay? So, John Steingard posted this on Instagram. He says, this is not a post I ever thought that I would write, but now I feel like I really need to. I've agonized over whether to say this publicly, and if so, how to do it. But I now feel that it's less important how I do it, and more important that I do it. So here goes. After growing up in a Christian home, being a pastor's kid, playing and singing in a Christian band, and having the word Christian in front of most of the things in my life, I am now finding that I no longer believe in God. The last few words of that sentence were hard to write. I still find myself wanting to soften that statement by wording it differently or less specifically, but it wouldn't be as true. I will say this, I appreciate him just being straightforward. Uh, I, I really don't like people who beat around the bush, generally speaking, when it comes to important matters. So this is good. Uh, kind of good. Not good, but good, if you know what I mean. Uh, then the next part, because the process of getting to that sentence has been several years in the making. It didn't happen overnight or all of a sudden. It's more like pulling on the threads of a sweater and one day discovering that there was no sweater left. Uh, we saw Rhett and Link use the same analogy as basically the idea of just constantly, uh, you know, uh, oh, I don't know about this, I don't know about that. One little doubt leads to another. I've, uh, and it's, it's a pretty good analogy if you're referring to something that's slowly disappearing that as you're getting curious at it. But the, what's funny is that the more I've pulled on the sweater string, the more my faith has deepened. Uh, and I think that's where we're going to be heading here a little bit. But hold on. I have been terrified, to be honest, about this publicly for quite some time because of all that I thought I would lose. I'm still scared, but I'm writing about this now for a few reasons. 
First, I simply can no longer avoid it. Processing this quietly felt right when I simply had doubts, but once they solidified into genuine point of view, it began to feel dishonest not to talk about it. So yes, that's his first point. It'd feel dishonest not to talk about it. This is true. It would be if you're constantly living and breathing the music, the Christian scene, and, you, and you're not affirming any of the things that you say you believe or you're singing about, yeah, it would be a little crummy. And you know, obviously, he's been at this for a little while, which we're going to see here in a second. Secondly, I have had private conversations with trusted friends about my doubts and discovered to my absolute shock that they are shared by nearly every close friend my age who also grew up in the church. I am stunned by the number of people in visible positions within church circles that feel the same way as I do. Like me, they fear losing everything if they're open about it. I hope that my openness and transparency can be an encouragement to them and to you if you feel the same. This is the alarming part. This is the part that screams at me a little bit. Yes, so he admits the fact that there's many people high up in the Christian scene who have the same doubts and might uh, actually be agnostic. In fact, uh, Cameron Bertuzzi interviewed, um, oh, what's her name? I forget her name, but about liberal Christianity. And she talked about how she joined a small group and that in that small group, the pastor came out as agnostic. And this is a thing we're seeing a lot now. And I think it's because, in all honesty, I don't think we're holding on to what Hebrews tells us to do, which is we're not, you know, we're told not to neglect that great salvation. We ought to take it a bit more seriously. Think about it. Pray over it. You know, really actually dig into your salvation and these issues. But instead, what I oftentimes see is people have questions and they're not fully seeking them out rationally. They have objections. Remember, I referred to this in my Marty Sampson video. If you haven't seen that, you can check that out. But these are cage stage atheist questions that he's about ready to bring up. And that's what a lot of these people have. They ca they're cage stage atheist questions. You know, basically scraping the same you know things that people have been talking about for thousands of years philosophically. And there's plenty of good argumentation and great answers for all of them, biblically and philosophically. Yet we'd see that many of these people aren't satisfied with that, or if they're not satisfied with it, they're simply not looking into it, and they're just letting that doubt grow and grow and grow into a greater monster. And they keep trying to take that that doubt, shove it under the rug, and essentially what happens is that that doubt turns into a monster that gets a few pounds larger every time. So anyway. Then he says, thirdly, I've got a whole lot less to lose now. The band isn't playing shows or making new music at the moment, and we've all found other work and careers to focus on for the time being. In order to make sure I'm able to keep providing for my family, that had to be the case before I could be totally honest. And that fact is one of the issues I have with the church and the Christian culture, culture in general. Okay, so he has a problem with Christian culture when if he comes out and says, I no longer believe in God. He has a problem with Christian culture that Christians no go, okay, so you're not part of our culture anymore. Why, do you, why does he have a problem with that? If you no longer affirm Christianity, then why are you, then why are you bothered when people don't want to hold your Christian position anymore? You're okay, well, you're, not, you're no longer one of us, so you think we're going to keep, keep you on payroll and keep letting you influence the people when we're trying to evangelize the world for Jesus Christ? Like, what? It's like me, it would be like, you know, me you know, living in, uh, in the Middle East and everyone's Muslim and then me going, well, I'm a Christian now and then expecting them to be completely okay with it. Okay, it's not as extreme as maybe that would be because that would probably result in my head being removed from my shoulders. But the thing is, is it's, it's, it's silly. Uh, of course, you're going to lose your position to a degree if you don't affirm the faith. This is a silly. Um, I get it though. I mean, I, I understand the fact that yes, you have a family. Yes, you have bills to pay. Yes, I get it. You know, life is life. There's, there are real actual consequences to these things. I'm not saying they're not. But, and I mean, as a, as a husband, I get that. As, you know, a father, I get that. I, I understand these things that you have to pay your bills. Um, so I get the fact that, yeah, you could lose your position. Now, granted, this, it shouldn't always result in a loss of position in certain cases. Um, and I'm not talking about if you deny the faith. Uh, if you deny the faith and you go apostate, then absolutely you shouldn't be in uh, Christian positions of influence. But I mean, sometimes uh, I do see the fact that sometimes somebody at a certain college or church might change a slight position within the church. Like they might go from like Arminian to Calvinist and suddenly because now they're more Calvinist, they get kicked out of a church, even though they affirm everything of the faith. They just slightly disagree on one area. I have seen that happen. I do think that's wrong, but we're not talking about that. We're not talking about a slight doctrinal difference for somebody who affirms speaking in tongues and somebody who doesn't affirm speaking in tongues. We're talking about whether or not the God of the universe exists. 
Yes, you're going to lose your position. Yes, you're not going to be in positions of influence. And the fact that you take issue with that just shows that tells me that even though you were in the Christian scene, you must not have fully really ever grasped the, the, the fullness of what was happening, the mission that you were supposedly on. Um, I know it might sound harsh and maybe, you know, somebody might say I'm being too harsh there, but this is, is the reality. If you were, if you're a Christian, you realize that you were trying to evangelize the world to get them out of hell, uh, to bring them to the only thing that can cure them of their sin and the, you know, the desolateness of sinfulness, uh, then I, I don't know. I, if you don't, that's your mission. Your mission is to save, try to lead people to Christ. And if you actually understood that mission, you'd understand why because you don't want people leading them away. Anyway, I spent a lot longer on that topic than I wanted to. So he goes this, says this. So if you're someone who follows me because of Hawk Nelson and my involvement in Christian music, you, pro you are probably thinking, wait, were you lying to me this whole time? Were you just pretending to be a Christian? What about all those songs you wrote? Did you mean those? I mean, those are honest questions, but I think other people are just going to be more going, why do you no longer believe in God? What got you there? But um, I mean, I guess people would be wondering, when did this happen? And he goes, the short answer is that I was not lying. I did believe those things at, at the time. I may have been pulling on the threads of the sweater, but there was still some sweater left, ba left back then. So what did the sweater thread pulling process look like? Okay, let's get into it. And now remember, this is my thing. Whenever there's a deconversion story, whenever there's a story of someone resigning the faith, I expect to, for them to bring forth their top reasons. With uh, Marty Samson, it was basically like, it was the problem of evil and why would God, a good God send people to hell? This guy did the same thing. Uh, Rhett and Link, it was, it, all you heard was really an emotional story of Link saying, I feel nothing. So for him, it was mostly feeling. And then for Rhett, it was just like, well, evolution. I found evolution has this argument that actually works. So I guess God can't exist. And then, of course, then they mentioned homosexuality, which homosexuality is a big reason why people are resigning the faith now, because it's a hot button topic and we're shamed a lot on the Christian position. Well, that's a video for another time, which I do plan to tackle eventually. If people would stop resigning the faith, it would allow me time to actually do those videos. But here we are. All right. So here he says, I get, it. so he goes, let's get into it. Now he goes, I grew up in a loving Christian home. My dad was a pastor and still is. Oof. And as far back as I can remember, life was all about the church. It was our community. It was our family. It feels important to point out that church wasn't something we went to once a week. It was more like something we came back, we came home to as often as possible. After bravely venturing out into the world when necessary, it wasn't a part of our life. It was our life. And this is true. When you really grow up in a, an involved church, that church becomes your family. Uh, I have a, My church is like that. We're a small little community and a family, and my church growing up was like that. I was always there. Um, I don't, that's not a bad thing. It's actually a great thing to have community. A lot, of people are, a lot of people are depressed and lonely in the world because they don't have community. So one of the best parts about church, uh, outside of obviously God and redemption through Jesus Christ, is the fact that we have fellowship, and not a lot of people have that. So anyway... But he goes, when you grow up in a community that holds a shared belief and that shared belief is so incredibly central to everything, you simply adopt it. Everyone I was close to believed in God, accepted Jesus into their hearts, prayed for signs and wonders, and participated in church, youth groups, conferences, and ministries. So I did too. So basically he goes, he makes it, I, I, he in a nicer way says, I was indoctrinated and I bought it. Uh, because that's just what you do when you're around those people. Uh, and in many ways, that's true, right? The nature versus nurture, depending on what, you know, how you're being nurtured and raised, you're going to adopt certain views. But the issue is, is that this is where why apologetics is so important. I'm glad we're seeing a rise in apologetics again right now, because we need more people going, answering these questions. These church should not just be a place where you hear moral stories. It should not be a place where you just hear, you know, the resurrection story once in a while, though those are important, but we need to have proper apologetics to show that the theistic Christian worldview actually is very sustainable and is actually very sensible. And if not the most sensible, I would say, I'd argue it is the most sensible. But that's, again, for another time. But we're going to hop into, I guess, some of those reasons here. But anyway. I became interested in music 
began playing and singing in worship teams and started leading worship at church and youth events. Even then, I remember being uncomfortable with certain things. Praying in public always felt like some kind of weird performance art. Emotional cries such as, Holy Spirit, come fill this place, always felt clunky and awkward, leaving my lips. A youth conference I attended encouraged every teen to sign a pledge that they would date Jesus for a year. Okay. And he, uh, hold on, I've, I gotta come on this as I go, or else I will forget to do all this. Yeah, the praying in public thing. Um, I don't really mind praying in public as long. And he, as he says here, it felt like it was like a performance art. And this is true. I've seen this before, and it makes me uncomfortable too. Uh, I think a lot of Christians affirm this. Like we go, yeah, it's weird when someone does. It. And then when he, Holy Spirit, per, uh, come fill this place. I I find that really weird. That is very much uh, more, I guess, on the Pentecostal side of things. You'll see that kind of response more, or in the charismatic circles, especially. I don't do those things uh, really. I I, I do pray. Um, I, I will see people lift their hands in prayer and stuff in church. But honestly, yeah, he's got a point. The showmanship, uh, and the performance art in the actual worship of God is not okay. We should get rid of that, and we should try to avoid that. And everything should be genuine, not a performance. Uh, it should be coming straight from the heart. So I, he's got a point there. And then when he says, a youth conference I attended encouraged every teen to sign a pledge that they would date Jesus for a year. Where do people get these ideas? Uh, purity culture is just, can we just say it is what it, it is, it was, or is what it is, or was? It was terrible. It was an awful idea. The whole, the whole point of obviously was to keep, you know, your sexual purity. Uh, that's good. I, I, yes, that's, that's good. Um, but the rest of purity culture should probably go. You know, abstinence, cool. Everything else, not cool about it. It's just, it's really awkward. Dating Jesus. That's just, that's awkward and borderline, like, heretical. Like, I don't date Jesus. I worship Jesus. He's not my lover. He's my God. <laughs> He's my... <laughs> uh, man. Let's continue. It felt manipulative and unsettling to me. I didn't sign it. <laughs> Good for you, John. Don't sign that. That document's weird. You don't need to date Jesus. You're fine. All right. I figured I was overthinking all these things. This was the beginning of my doubt. <laughs> nope. You were not overthinking them, John. You were completely correct. Uh, that would, and that, hmm. now this is a, a, one of the reasons why people seem to believe, like start disbelieving in God is when they start realizing that some of those weird, they start questioning the weird traditional stuff or the weird, like cultural Christianity stuff. They start questioning that and then they start associating is all that is God. We see this with legalism. We see this with um, performance-based Christianity. We see this with weird cultural things. As soon as they start questioning those things, they completely pull the ejection handle and they bail out. And that is not the way it should be. Uh, that's that's also silly. It's like just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Like this one thing is bad about this or this one thing is not good about it. So I'm out. You know, we see that with altar calls. It's just, there's so many things that it's like, why do people always respond in pendulum swings? You know, I'm over here and then, oh, I don't like that. Then so I, of course I have to swing to the next extreme, which means that I have to doubt everything because of the one little thing. This is why, um, I'm just going to make this comment fast. This is why biblical Christianity is important. Okay. Biblical. Don't try to get cutesy. Don't try to get creative in all these cutesy little ways. And don't try to like create so many programs around everything. You know, the God's word is sufficient and it is sufficient. And I think if we took more, it's really funny actually, the first youth group I took over uh, in my pastorate, uh, it was so funny because I came in there with Bible. And I remember, and we, all right, guys, I'm going to teach you guys hermeneutics. Let's talk about how to interpret this, this book of yours, because I don't want you guys to depend on me all the time for your teaching. And to see how the kids grew just from that alone was insane. And, you know, it's because, and then even in my church, and the people have grown. And one, one young man, I think of specifically in my church, it's like, yeah, because all I did was focus on the word. I didn't try to get cutesy with it. I didn't try to create a false program. But anyway. That's crazy that that's where his doubts began. So anyway, the beginning. Uh, this was the beginning of my doubt, and I began to develop the reflex to simply push it down and soldier on. After all, everyone I knew and loved believed in God, Jesus, and the Bible. So I felt it must be true. Again, we see him just throwing the baby out with the bathwater. So then he goes, at the age of 20, I joined Hawk Nelson and began touring with the band. 
It was a blast. Our music wasn't overtly Christian, but as time went on, we became more outspoken about our faith and our music. To be fair, I was one of the loudest voices pushing for that shift because I believed it would lead to more success in the Christian music world. I'm glad he admitted this, and this is a big problem for me in general also. This is what makes me always leery of, of uh, a lot of modern Christianity. See, there's a lot of people who are talented in the world, all right? There's a lot of talented musicians. Um, I've always been a pretty decent musician, but not amazing by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a good violinist. I'll give that, and I'm like, I, I, I can do the rest of this stuff, but violin is my thing. But... When people basically are going, well, I have this skill and I have this talent, and now I can get into the music world uh, with Christianity because it's far less competitive maybe than over here. And, you know, essentially, essentially, basically, it's, it's, it's kind of this idea whenever you read stories like this, because some heavy metal bands have done the same thing, uh, is basically like, these Christians are really dumb, and we could probably get in there and be more successful with them. Now, granted, it sounds like they were all Christians. To be fair, okay, they were Christians, it sound like, at the time, or at least he believed in God at the, well, not really, he didn't really believe at this point. It sounded like he was majorly doubting and barely holding on by a sweater thread, to use his term. So, um, you know, it sounds like they were, so they're like, oh, we just go over here and we'll be more successful. Which is never a good motivator. Just do, I don't make a lot of money. I don't have, made, I've spent more money doing this than I ever have anything else and probably in my whole life without getting a dime in return. But, you know, don't always do what makes you popular. That's, that's the point. Anyway, when I became the lead, the lead singer and main songwriter in 2012, this shift was r fully realized. We went from singing Bring Em Out to songs like Drops in the Ocean. Google the lyrics, the difference is not subtle and that is the truth that, that seriously drops in the ocean is heavily christian and then bring them out is a little you know <laughs> a little bit more vague <laughs> to put it that way okay so anyway even through this shift there were still many things about christian culture that made me uncomfortable in fact the list was growing there were things that just didn't make sense to me and here's why apologetics is important and doing proper Bible teaching is important. Ready? Let's go. If God is all loving and all powerful, why is there evil in the world? Can he not do anything about it? Does he choose not to? Is the evil in the world a result he, his, of his desire to give us free will? Okay, then what about the famine and disease and the floods and all the suffering? This isn't caused by humans and our free will. If God is loving, why does he send people to hell? I should just make you guys rewatch my Marty Sampson video. But again, he's bringing up questions that have been asked for well over 2,000 years at this point and have been answered for well over 2,000 years. Let me go ahead and give you the lowdown. Every apologist has a different way to answer this, but mine is pretty straightforward. Is God all loving and all powerful? Yes. Why is there evil in the world? Is it because of free will? Yes. So here's the thing, God, uh, this is the Epicurean paradox, God cannot create a world with free will and no possibility for evil. I know someone goes, what? What do you mean? Uh, you know, he's God, he can do whatever. No, God cannot do that which is completely contrary, okay? In other words, he can't make, I'll use Braxton Hunter's example in our video, he can't make a square circle. Why? Because those are mutually exclusive things. So again, to have free will and then not be able to have free will to choose evil is not free will. You're just a robot or you have a very much more selected view of being able to choose. So all of a sudden your options went from free will to like, uh, you, you can choose one of three things, but one of the, but because I do not allow evil. So yes, it is because of free will. Uh, and this is what people don't understand. If, do they realize the conclusion of what they're asking? What they're asking for, if they want God to get rid of free will, is they want God to be the helicopter parent or Superman who swoops in at the last minute and saves everything. Which means in the end, you are not you. You are not a person and you are not responsible for your actions. In fact, you would just simply be the result cause of a already determinate God who's already determined every single thing that you ever do. And therefore, nothing's really your choice. So the free will is excruciatingly important when it comes to the uh, problem of evil. And then also, then it goes, okay, well, if that's the case, then uh, what about famine, disease, and floods? As if those are not also related to sin? 
Our world was perfect before sin. That is the whole thing. When he says that I curse the ground, so in Genesis, when God it says he curses the ground for us men to work, he basically is also implying the rest of the world is going to be messed up. And all throughout the scripture, we see that. In fact, that's the whole point of like the future of the kingdom is this idea that the lion lays down with the lamb and all this stuff. It is because they, he's basically saying it goes back to paradise in the end. Now read the parable of the sower and the seed and all that. You'll see how this works out in the end. All the other people get thrown into, into the fiery furnace and those others get to reach the kingdom of God. That is the reward for being a faithful servant. And the, this whole thing, so anyway, this here, his desire to give us, yeah, and then, um, so God can cause calamity. In fact, in Isaiah, it says, you know, God, you know, he makes evil happen, and that, in the King James, it says evil, but in all the other translations, it says calamity. So he can make calamity happen, okay? We've seen that happen. Uh, but again, if God is all, if God is all loving and all powerful, he forgot one little important part here also, all just, which gives us to our next point, and calamity. Why does he, God send people to hell? Again, you're asking the wrong question. The question is, why would God not send us to hell? If you have broken a holy, perfect, righteous law that is completely righteous, that is so heinous that the wages of it, the punishment for it is death, then why would God not send you to hell? You are, uh, you're a guilty criminal, same as me. We, are all, we do not deserve anything else but hell. And that is where you're going wrong on this, too. God doesn't send you to hell. You send yourself to hell. God created hell to punish the sin and the sinner. One might say it, he even created it for Satan himself and the fallen man or anyone who has sinned because sin must be punished. Why? Because he is all just. So, yes, he is all loving. He is all powerful. But he's also all just. This whole idea of God being all just is extremely important with his love because he is all just. He had to send people. He had to send people. He had to create a place for punishment. So yes, people do have to get sent to hell. People are going, they, they are going to hell in a handbasket, okay? It's them doing it. But God is also all loving. So what does he do to balance this out? Well, because he's all just, somebody has to take the fall. Somebody has to get punished. That is the point. That is what it means to, that's what it means to be all just. But because he is all loving, he wanted to rescue the creation that he loved, that he loves now, that he forever loves. When he created all things, he knew these things. So what did he do? He had, if you could say, a fail safe, so to speak. No analogy is perfect. Okay, bear with me. And he has Jesus. He, t he becomes man and dies on the cross himself. What is, why is it significant that he became man? Why is it important that the word became flesh? Because mankind is the one who sinned. So it had to be, the sacrifice had to be done from a man, a perfect man, one without blemish. So that way he could actually say, because he's without blemish and perfect, he could actually say, I take their punishment. That is the point. So that way it satisfies the all righteous anger of God and his justice, but also satisfies his love. And what does he say? But just believe on me. Repent and believe. If any man confesses with his mouth and knows in his heart, blah, 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 that, you know, that Jesus Christ rose from the dead, he shall be saved. That is the story. That is the sum of it, okay? So the whole idea here, that whenever people bring up the problem of evil, I, just ha I usually take a real issue with it just in general because if there is no God anyway, your complaint is null and void. Then it's not evil. Then it's just particles, accident, a, a cosmic accident running around as particles, just action and reaction, and it's all accidental anyway, so your complaint is null and void. As a Christian and a theist, you actually can have a proper answer for this, which is simply there is a righteous law, there is a perfect law, and that law must be followed and is dictated by God, who is all just, but because, so therefore, I am condemned by my own actions. I am held responsible. But he is also all loving and created a way out for me and took the blame himself. And see, people also don't seem to get this aspect of it. They want to blame God for all of it, but guess what? He already took the blame. <laughs> he already took the blame. He goes, yeah, I'll take the blame. Okay, I will put this in on my shoulders. Just believe in me. So what was your objection again? He took the blame. What more do you want? 
I find that's anyway. I find all these things to be kind of silly when you really get down to it, because they always forget the fact. And I've noticed that that's a big thing in modern Christianity today. They always talk about how loving God is and how powerful He is, but they keep forgetting how just He is. And I'm sorry if you look in the Old Testament, it is uh, actually. Hold on, He gets to that here in a second. I found, however, that consulting and discussing the Bible didn't answer my questions. It only amplified them. Good questions are good. That's when you when you get answers. I mean, that's when you get reset button on that. When you get questions, that's when you seek answers. And that is when you equip yourself more and more and more. And it actually deepens your faith in the end. I've had a lot of questions and I sought out answers. And guess what? I am still rock solid in the faith. I believe and affirm the resurrection more so than I did before. You know, for me, it was like, well, I just have faith, of course. And I, but then I realized after a while that my blind faith was just blind ignorance. And I didn't have, I didn't realize that, you know, a biblical faith means that there has to be uh, reason and things to be held on to, you know, to have faith in. Otherwise, I'm having faith just in nothing. So, anyhow. I digress. But, all right, so then he goes, why does God seem so pissed off in most of the Old Testament? By the way, guys, I'm just going to say this on my channel. I'm not going to censor stuff that much like this, okay? Um, we're adults. We can be adults about it. This is what he said. I don't think if, if peed off irritates you, then don't hear, follow anything that possibly people who are not of the faith say. Anyway. So I'm just not censoring all these things. So if that bothers you, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Um, why does God seem so pissed off in most of the Old Testament? And then all of a sudden, he's a loving father in the New Testament. Why does he say not to kill, but then instructs Israel to turn around and kill men, women, and children to take the promised land? <sighs> he's, okay, he does get ticked off in the Old Testament a lot. But guess what? He also gets ticked off in the New Testament a lot. Uh, there's Ananias and Sapphira who were killed uh, <laughs> by God in Acts. And you get to the end, and there's this little book called Revelation. And I'm not sure if you've heard about it, but there's literally, literally a horseman of death. Again, he is all just as well. So yeah, God is regularly ticked off because he's righteous. And unrighteousness is kind of ticks them off. And you know what's funny is that that's a ter that is so silly to accuse God of because when somebody does something unrighteous towards you, you get ticked off too. If somebody broke, into, broke the window of your car and stole your wallet, let's say, that you kept there overnight, which you shouldn't have, you would be ticked off. Why? Because something immoral just took place. Why? Almost because, why, why do you know that? Because God wrote that law upon your heart. But now you no longer have a moral code to hold to besides your own opinion. So I guess this is null and void. But anyway. So, um, let's see. Why does, he not, uh, why does he say not to kill, but then instructs Israel to turn around and kill men, women, and children? Hold up. Hold up. There's a difference between kill and murder. Okay, well, thou shalt not kill, that Hebrew word there means murder. That means Brian, when he is here, he is not here tonight, I can't just go up to him and, as I always say with him, stab him in the eye. The reason why I say that, by the way, he has like this thing with eyes. He like, and you know how certain people are grossed out by feet? Brian is grossed out by people touching eyes. So I love threatening to stab his eye. Just so you know, that's why I say this regularly. It makes him cringe, and his discomfort brings me joy. Okay, so then it's the, so he, he's not saying to go murder these people. Also, if you actually study this, oh man, I forgot. I was gonna bring the book here and show it. Um, I'll just put a little uh, right uh, here. Is a picture of this book. Is God a moral monster? Please read this book if you have any questions about such things. The short story is God does not command them to kill men, women, and children. In fact, if you actually study the context, you'll know that it was actually uh, just basically bombastic, exaggerated war language that they were using, and the uh, outposts that they attacked were actually military outposts. Okay, and then of course when Joshua is giving like his big speeches, he's like, "And we will sweep over the hills. We'll burn their cities to the ground. We will kill their men, women, and children." And really, they just took out like a military outpost. That was actually a normal war language for the culture of the ancient Near East. That's the way it was. So please, 
this is why good Bible teaching is important. And it's important to point those things out in the story where it's like, look, the, notice, because you'll actually see if you actually study this and you actually notice the geography that the Bible mentions throughout is that the Canaanites actually, the, uh, Israel kind of grew because certain Canaanites just simply chose to convert to Israel because Israel was actually a much better place to live than Canaan. Uh, if you compare the laws of the land, you will see that there, there it's just the Canaanites were extremely brutal with their laws, and uh, Israel, the only thing that pretty much guaranteed a death the death penalty was actually murder. Everything else, even though it might say that this person can, should be put to death, there's also other laws before that that they considered, and also the judges would make decisions, and there's not a lot of times um, in Old Testament history or ancient Israel history where people were actually executed. And if you read the Talmud, you will find that there actually, if there is a certain amount of killings within a certain amount of years that they actually found, considered that person to be a bloodthirsty high priest. So there's a lot of things there to unpack. Uh, I, I feel like these are videos for another time specifically, but the point is here that this is simply a misunderstanding of the text. And it is one of those things where um, pastors need to do better at teaching this sort of thing. So anyway, um, then he goes, uh, why does God let Job suffer horrible things just to win a bet with Satan. Okay. A um, <laughs> couple things there. You actually got a really fun, unique picture in the book of Job of seeing the behind the scenes of spiritual warfare. You don't see this a lot in, in the Bible, hardly at all, besides Job. So we don't really see this going on a lot nowadays either. So the point is, is God let us a little bit behind the curtain on what's happening. Satan simply wants to take out Job. And God goes, no, he's my servant. He is faithful. Do your worst. See what happens. And the problem is, here is yes, Job suffered. He suffered a lot. And then when he asks God why, finally God responds and goes, are you the ones who set barriers to the oceans? Are you the one who, you know, made man's mouth, essentially, you know, open, create the blind and all that? He goes, it's like two chapters of all the things that God has done in the world. And then Job goes, never mind, I know, realize my place, I am so sorry, I will never question again, because it was a perspective check. And if you are questioning Almighty God because you just don't like the hand you were dealt when you don't know the full picture, um, you need to have a reality check. You just need to understand the fact that, hmm, you know what, I need to remember my place in the world, and my place in the world is not, you know, questioning God on every little thing that happens in my life. But guess what happened in the end? Job ended up, you know, he, it turned out okay for him in the end. He went through with horrible things and his, you know, he did lose children. I'm not trying to downplay that as someone who suffered from similar things like that. I get it. But the thing is, is that with that whole scenario that he's discussing, it's, Job is just a really poor example in general because guess what? Do you know how many people were also encouraged in the faith? By Job? It wasn't winning a bet with Satan. It was demonstrating the power of faithfulness to Almighty God during times of suffering. And that's why Job says the Lord gives and the Lord takes away. But blessed be the name of the Lord, because I don't see the full picture. I only see my minuscule part of the canvas. And even in that story, I think we only got a minuscule part of the canvas. You will not know the fullness of all these things. And that's why his ways are higher than our ways, and his thoughts are greater than our thoughts. So again, Job, bad example, and it's not to win a bet with Satan. And if nothing else, you know, if you're looking at it in that sense, then you should be happy the fact that Job beat the bet, right? Like he came out on top in the end. So that's again, would be considered like an underdog scenario. So again, bolt, none of this really works. I've, I've really, I think this is the first time I've ever actually seen someone use Job as an objection. They usually use his next objection here, which is, um, why does he tell Abraham to kill his son? This one gets brought up again often. He goes more killing again, but he didn't kill him more killing again. And then he doesn't kill. More killing again, and then basically says, uh, says, uh, geez, and then basically say, just kidding, that was a test. <sighs> okay, a few things to unpack about that story with Abraham and Isaac. One, they were surrounded by a pagan culture that sacrificed their children all the time. They burned their children to a god called Molech all the time. And guess what? 
Abraham was told by God, mm, go up to that mountain and sacrifice Isaac. And Abraham's like, what? I mean, in a sense, you know, you, know, you can imagine. And what happens? He, he goes, all right, I mean, you're God, but, you know, he knew God. And that's the funny part about this that nobody seems to mention is the context before. God bailed Abraham out of a lot of scenarios. And God had never led Abraham astray. And even when Abraham was talking to the people before he leaves, he goes, when we return down the mountain, like he basically knew the fact that he was going to return with Isaac. He just had no idea what God was up to. And then in the New Testament, we later on find out that basically Abraham you know, could have had enough faith for uh, Isaac to be resurrected even. So there's a lot of interesting little things there. But the point is, is Abraham knew God was faithful and that he wasn't going to leave him. And there was, and there's a foreshadowing here. Again, little picture compared to big picture with people who are faithful. When you're a faithful person of God, you will know that you can pursue things and you can push and you can go suffer through things and you can just go through the worst things ever. And when you're faithful, you know, I only see a couple strokes on this canvas. I don't see the full painting. I'm going to put faith and trust in God. But when you're just centered on yourself the entire time and not what God is doing, when the, the, he who paints the amazing picture of your life, when you don't follow him, uh, then you just simply start whining and complaining like this uh, and not understand the fact that there is a bigger picture at play. So this is us. It, it, what happened? What was the moral of the story? Moral of the story was a loving father who really wanted a son was given a son and now the son was going to have to be sacrificed. And then so Abraham goes up there and then what happens? It says in the text, God provided his own sacrifice. And there was that ram, and they saw the ram, and the rambles, and the angel says, good, sacrifice the ram. And so, and I will prepare, I will prepare myself sacrifice, and the roles were switched. This is amazing foreshadowing of what happened with the Messiah, with Jesus Christ, who died on the cross. He was the one where God, God provided his own sacrifice. But instead, this time, God did not withhold the knife. God did not withhold the death. He withheld Isaac's death, but he did not withhold the death of his own son. And that is some cool foreshadowing. Beautiful. It happened in thousands of years. And we know this happened just by textual history, which we're about to get to as well. That this happened thousands of years beforehand and perfectly foreshadows the story of Jesus. Um, so foreshadowing is cool. And you know what? If you think God was horrible and manipulative, obviously Abraham didn't. And Abraham and Isaac were, would be considered the victims here. And they didn't think God was. They knew God would just simply be faithful through this, and in the end, they were rewarded for it and saw an, God work amazing things. So anyway, why does Jesus have to die for our sins? More killing again. I think I already explained this when I went on my tangent about perfectly just and perfectly loving. Jesus had to die because only blood can wash away sins. It's, it's the atonement. It, so blood has to. Why? Because just the justice. So justice, something has to pay for the crime. And so Jesus simply did that because uh, God is all loving and he is all just. Those things have to be in check. So there's your balance. The check and balances. Boom. There you go. If God can do anything, can't he forgive without someone dying? Um, okay. Um, okay. I, I'm going to finish this. If God can do anything, can't he forgive without someone dying? I mean, my parents taught me to forgive people. Nobody dies in that scenario. Okay, this is uh, interesting here. Okay, so the point, first off, that's not biblical forgiveness. Biblical forgiveness means someone has to repent. Uh, this is uh, an unpopular view in Christianity, uh, but it's one that is starting to resurface, and I think this is true. Forgiveness, in order for forgiveness to take place, repentance have to, has to happen. That is why when people don't admit to their faults and they hurt people drastically and they betray them and they run, maybe a spouse cheated on another spouse and bailed out with another person, that person remains hurt and bitter with that person almost their entire life, even when they say they forgave them. And when they forgive them, that means that they're, you know, they're not, try, they're not trying to hold on to this every day, but there's still this deep-rooted scar. Why? Because that person never turned around and repented and apologized deeply, profusely, and meaningfully. And that is why God tells us, it's not just belief. It's not just this easy believe and it's done. He goes, repent and believe. Turn away from your wicked ways. Admit your fault. Focus on me and believe on me. And we are to do likewise. That's why if we don't forgive our neighbor, God won't forgive us. If someone repents, and repents, we ought to forgive them. Now, th this is not to say you sit there and hold a cloud over their head either. This is just spiritual, spiritual physics. This is why people have a really hard time 
moving on past things because this is spiritual physics. Repentance always has to precede forgiveness. Um, so, yeah, no one has to die in that scenario, but you know why also no one has to die in that scenario? You're not a holy and perfect righteous God who is all loving and all just. You're a sinful man, and you know you can't hold a sinful man to a greater standard than your own sinfulness. So, that's why. He gets to make those judgment calls because he's all just. Hence, judgment. <laughs> all right? So, sorry if I seem a little cheeky in this. this is just, these are just things that it blows me away. This is like basic Bible doctrine 101 I'm going through. He goes, I was raised to believe that the Bible was the perfect word of God. Sure, it was written by human beings, but those who those people were divinely inspired, and we can consider the words they wrote to be the word of God. Good job, John. That's correct. <laughs> it's, it's true. I mean, they, move, they wrote as they were moved by the Holy Spirit, and every word is breathed out by God. So, yep, accurate and accurate. He goes, I began to, uh, also, just so you know, even if we found a contradiction, which I don't think we will because I affirm the inherency of Scripture and all that, and I've looked into it, whatever. Even if we found a contradiction in Scripture, can we please at least admit to the fact that, okay, we find one thing wrong. Uh, does that mean you throw out the entire book and the resurrection never happened? I mean, we've, I've heard uh, very intense Baptist pastors say this, you know, if one part's wrong, all of it's wrong. And I just think that's bad logic. Uh, I mean, how many times have you even been reading, a, have you read a great uh, document of some sort or a book of some sort with certain data and then later on you find out that one, that one part of the data is wrong. Does that mean the whole book's wrong? I mean, no. Uh, it just might mean that you might have to reshift the, your view on that part of the book a little bit or maybe even possibly the Christians misunderstood a certain part of the book. I don't know. There's a lot of if, ands, or buts about that, but I just, anyway. I do hold to the inerrancy of scripture though and I would say, good job, John. You are correct. The Bible is the Word of God, and you were taught correctly there. I just really wish that either somebody took time to teach you these things, or that these things would have stuck with you. Because in all honesty, as cheeky as I might be coming off, and I really don't mean to be, I'm just really, I'm just speaking pretty strongly. Uh, I do wish that he, and I hope he does come back to the faith. Uh, I, I really hope he one day sees the logical inconsistencies here, or gets the, uh, you know, especially the problem of evil. I've always found that weird that people are like, I have a problem with evil, so now I'm going to disavow theism, which allows me to actually have an objection toward evil. I've never understood it. So anyway, um, and then he goes, I began to have questions and doubts about that. Okay, so he has doubts about, about the Word of God. It seemed like there were a lot of contradictions in the Bible that didn't make sense. I don't want to get too deep in the weeds, so I'll have the details for another time. Suffice it to say that when I began to believe that the Bible was simply a book written by people as flawed and imperfect as I am, that was when my belief in God truly began to unravel. So this is silly too in a number of ways. So yeah, okay. First off, I really wish he would get more into the specifics there because, honestly, it would probably be beneficial for us to be able to. Um, that way we could actually address these so-called contradictions. I've seen a lot of people claim contradictions, and there aren't any. Uh, and, or they're, like the contradiction is like, oh, that's your contradiction? Well, that's explained here, so that's actually not what that is. Or people, usually it's people misunderstanding a particular text, or they're saying things like, well, he said not to kill, but then he killed, and as opposed to the idea of warfare, a righteous war, which, you know what, dang it, I forgot to mention that, so we're going to talk about it real quick. So here we have the Canaanites who are literally like worshiping, I'm not worshiping, like, oh, well, they are worshiping, they're worshiping Moloch, but we have these Canaanites who are literally burning children alive, babies being sacrificed on altars, horrible, wicked people. And God goes, you know what? Wipe them out. I have given them enough grace. Wipe them out, take out their military outposts, and basically submit them um, to Israel. And of course, we see that a lot converted out of Canaan and into Israel. But anyway, he said, wipe them out. And what you basically have here is people go, have, wanting their cake and ha, wanting to have their cake and eat it too. Uh, so in one objection, you say, well, there's all this evil in the world. Why doesn't God do anything about it? And then he does something about it. And everyone's like, oh, why would you do that? Why would you kill those people? That's horrible. You can't have both. Either you have a God that's righteous when he intervenes, or you have a God who's passive, or you have, you know, a God who is loving and, you know, is passive. I don't know. It's just, it's a contradiction. So either you have a God who's just and he takes action, or you have a God who's all, you know, fluff and love and passive. That's what you have here. Um, so, 
find it silly anyway. Um, then he goes, suffice it to say, I began what, to believe, believe that the Bible is simply a book written by people as flawed and imperfect as I am. See, this is the problem when you just come to random conclusions when you start thinking about this and you haven't researched it. Uh, if you actually look at the text and the history of it all and how it all interconnects with so many different things, you will find that it's not just these things written by dudes. These were written by God because they straight up prophesied things that happened thousands of years after, and we have good evidence of these things actually had taken place. Jesus is a great example. Um, so he says, during a vacation to Mexico with my wife's family, I had a revealing conversation with my father-in-law, who is also a pastor. Like my dad, he is a loving father, he is patient and sincere, and believes in God with all his heart. I was asking about a verse in 1 Timothy that seems really oppressive of women. It indicates that women shouldn't be in church leadership, shouldn't teach men, and shouldn't wear their hair in braids. To me, that seemed less like the message of the loving God that most Christians believe in now, and more like the ideas that would have been present in a culture at the time, a male-dominated society where women were treated as less like equals and more like property. Wrong. <laughs> I feel like Dwight Schrute says, wrong. Um, or false. That's it. False. Uh, sorry. I've, I've seen The Office through like once, okay? I, I, I could already hear the dislike buttons being clicked. It's fine. I'm a little upset. I'll be fine. Uh, this whole thing about being really oppressive to women. I hold to what's called complementarianism. Uh, the, women were never held as property. If you actually understand uh, Israel and how it treated women, it actually held them above a lot of things. Men may have been leaders and the uh, advocates of their family, but they were... They held women up in very high regard, very much to be treasured and, and, and helped and loved and protected. But not just that. Women were also strong, Proverbs 31, and a lot of other things. So here's the thing. Um, women shouldn't be held in, in church leadership. Uh, it depends on the leadership. Women shouldn't teach over the men because their job is not to be the leader, to be teaching over men. Uh, the job is for men to step up into that role and for women to hold another one. I know this is... This is, this is uh, controversy, but you're on the church split, so you already knew that before you got here. Um, so the whole point is that women have different roles than men, and men have different roles than women. We are equal in value, different in our roles. Now, certain people disagree. I know there are great Christians who believe completely fall, fall into an egalitarian view, but honestly, when you read Genesis 1, the curse of man, and how that was supposed to work out, we see that oft, oft repeated all throughout scripture, and we actually see that in marriages, when they operate in that way, uh, in fact, Brian here, he talks about, he's talked about this before, and he might talk about it again on the program, but that was what was happening in his family, is that his wife was stepping up, she was getting frustrated, because she was leading, he was being passive, and over time, he was was like, oh, I'm not being a proper man. I'm not fulfilling my role. And so he takes the lead as his role in the family. And now guess what? Their marriage was on the rocks and now it's doing great because it's almost like God has a spiritual science that works out in this way and that we have a certain role. No matter how much people want to say genders are to be confused and that they're on a spectrum, they're simply not. There's men and there's women and we have our own roles. So anyway, um, and then the braided hair thing. Okay, seriously, he says, he says not with braided hair. Uh, the whole point here is vanity uh, of the outside and not the inside. The whole point is what is your heart on? Not saying that braiding your hair is evil. He also talked about gold plates and all these things, like because basically women would, were showing up to, you could almost say showing up to church at their Sunday best while their heart was rotting away. So they looked good on the outside, but on the inside they were horrible. So God's like, so Paul was like, no, not with costly array and braided hair. That's not the way you show that you love God, but do it in work and deed and all that. So that's what he's referring to there. Um, so he, it, again, this is one of those things, and I feel like if you actually uh, were raised in the church and taught well, you would know the context here, what Paul was saying. This just goes to show either you're being dishonest or you've had really bad Bible teaching. Um, anyway. My father-in-law asked me if I had been reading the King James Version because he felt that the King James had put his own spin on a lot of things and that version couldn't be fully trusted. So again, this is kind of... Um the father-in-law, it sounds like to me, just I'm from this, is going, ooh, well, you might be reading that wrong. Uh, it sounds like so he's probably more of an egalitarian type. So anyway, um, he, and the, his father-in-law father said, you have to go back to the original Greek. This is something I've had a, a, heard a lot over the years. I asked him, so it sounds like you believe that modern translations can't fully be trusted because they are human, flawed, and imperfect? I am simply taking that thought to its next natural conclusion. That original Greek is also human, flawed, and imperfect, and also can't fully be trusted. He replied, well, if you believe that, what do you have left? I said, exactly. 
Um, <laughs> exactly. Got him. No, this is silly too. Uh, okay, no. A translation is different than the original text. No matter what, a translation you always have to go back to the original meaning in any translation. If you and the, think about it, if you're reading any like the Art of War, okay, well by Sun Tzu, I have that upstairs. Um, if you read that, you know what? There's a lot of translational notes all throughout that because it's like, okay, this is one way to say this, or it could have been this. Uh, some of the manuscripts say this. Uh, this was what we did. Okay, that happens in every translation. Translations are translations. Uh, I'm a deaf interpreter um, on this. I do it. You know, I've been involved in deaf ministries and whatnot. I've led a deaf ministry before. Uh, in interpreting, this happens all the time. You have to find a way to convey the message that's difficult to convey in the other language. I use this example in another one, in another video, but I'm using it here. In Spanish, there's a phrase that says, I don't have hair on my tongue. That doesn't translate well to English. So, and it means I'm not a liar. So you just say, I'm not lying to you. Or do I look like a liar? You wouldn't actually say that specifically. So again, this is silly because a translation is always different. That does not mean that the original text is somehow bad, that the source is bad. And you know how we know the source isn't bad? Because we have thousands of manuscripts. Like if you include like all these different language, ancient languages and whatnot, it's like almost like 55,000 or something like that. It's absurdly high and we compare and cross compare and all these things and you draw the strings and you can easily see where all these things were completely accurate for eons. Uh, that's the whole thing that made the Dead Sea Scrolls so crazy was the fact that we saw how old these things were and how accurate they still were to the things that were made later. So again, this, that is, th these, these objections, it's silly because when you really think about it, it's like, dude, we have PhDs and doctorates, doctors who, in, on, uh, who have studied these manuscripts for years and they say they're reliable and you think you just got them in a simple word game? It doesn't make sense. I mean, sorry, you're not being consistent and you clearly haven't really truly researched this. So once I found that I didn't believe the Bible, was the perfect word of God, it didn't take long to realize that I was no longer sure he was there at all. That thought terrified me. It sent me into a tailspin. The implications of that idea were absolutely massive. Yes, absolutely. You get rid of the word of God, which is his way of communicating to mankind, almost like a written document from him that you can study, research, and verify is probably the best way for him to communicate with mankind without him directly coming down here and showing himself in full glory, basically going, showing, taking the fun, taking, taking the fun out of it, right? Taking the faith out of it, you know, that faith aspect of it, where we choose to love Him willingly, which is what makes a relationship great, is choosing Him willingly. So he right puts it on in a document. But yeah, if you d basically discount the Word of God, yeah, you're, it won't take long before you're out the door. Let me tell you, because that's the very thing that anchors you. So that thought terrified me. Uh, the implications of that idea were absolutely massive. Yes, you know why? Because you just gave up your origin, morality, meaning, identity, and destiny. All those right there. You just threw them right out the window and said, yeah, okay, I guess I'm a cosmic accident and there's no God and no morality. There's no meaning to life. Uh, I guess I'm just, a, I'm just a piece of meat flying on a rock around a sun for the next billion years. That's what mankind is until we eventually drift off into extinction. That's, that's basically it. That's a really depressing life to think about. So what do you do when, uh, okay, so over the past year, I've occasionally mentioned publicly my struggles with depression. This is what really kicked that off. What do you do when the rug is pulled out from under your feet, when you find yourself no longer believing the thing at the core of what you see yourself and see the world? What do I teach my own children? If I'm honest about this, will all my Christian friends abandon me? Will this alienate me from my family? Will this leave me with nothing? I mean, it very well could. It depends uh, how cantankerous you are. I, I, honestly, I, I hope that your friends and your family uh, surround you with love and they try to give you answers to these questions, try to evangelize you and bring you back to the faith. As Galatians 6.1 says, you who are spiritual, go restore such a one. I pray this happens with John. Because um, honestly, I actually kind of like their music. It was one of the you know, few modern Christian artists I didn't fully hate. Um, and I mean hate as in I just find their music cheesy. That's what I meant, okay? Not like I literally hate them just for the sake of hating them. I have to be careful on here. Somebody might twist my words. All right, anyhow. So, mm, uh, yeah, you struggle with depression. That's what really kicked off. Yes, not believing in God would be depressing because you have no meaning to life. 
Um, the, then he goes on to say, those are the questions that led me into a very dark place for a while. I feel like I've mostly emerged from that dark place now because I've discovered that life really does go on. I have trusted my friends that know this about me and love me anyways. My family has shown me incredible love and support, even though I know this grieves them. While I know I can no longer stand on stage and, and in good conscience sing songs like Drops in the Ocean, I no longer fear losing my place in Christian music. I know this means giving it up. And, voluntarily. Good. I'm glad you gave it up. I, I find it funny that you were complaining, though, at the beginning that people were going to kick, like, basically be like, all right, you're gone then if you don't believe in it. And now you're talking about leaving voluntarily. It's, and then you admit, I can't do this in good conscience, so why is that a problem? I just, I'm sorry, that first objection really, that, that really just confuses me. He goes, I'm ready to be transparent, open. I think that open part is key. I'm open to the idea that God is there. Good. I'm glad. I'd prefer it if he was. I suspect if he is there, he is very different than what I was taught. I know my parents pray that God reveals himself to me. If he's there, I hope he does. And this is good. This means that he's not closed off. It's not like he's like, oh, I hate Christianity and everything. It sounds like to me, this guy has just a lot of doubts and he hasn't been verified. He hasn't verified a lot of things. He hasn't really dug into it. He just had some doubts. He kind of strung some things together in his head. And then he goes, ooh, this, you know, he, he like that little tower and he pulled out a little block and the whole thing came tumbling down when he doesn't realize that there's a much stronger tower that he can build his faith on. And it's still with that book, but it's just having a better understanding of the things within it. Uh, and when he goes, you know, I suspect he's very different than the God he was taught. I don't think he's the God, if he comes back to God, it'll be this huge different God that he, he suddenly believes in or that God is that much different. But I think he'll realize that there's a lot more to the Bible and to these objections than he may have thought previously. But he goes, until then, I feel that the best thing I can do is be honest. Stepping away from the belief in God is, has felt like a loss in some ways. But it, it's felt like freedom in others. Less, uh, Jess and I both always had this sense that we weren't doing enough of the things we were supposed to do as Christians. We didn't enjoy going to church. We didn't enjoy reading the Bible. We didn't enjoy praying. We didn't enjoy worship. It all felt like obligation. And our lack of enthusiasm about those things always made us feel like something was wrong with us. Uh, yeah, sounds like to me, you guys, you know, you guys had some deeply rooted spiritual issues here. And again, maybe it's the fact that you didn't have a proper appreciation or understanding of these things. If you don't have a proper understanding of some of these things and you have a shallow Christianity, again, back to the parable of the sower and the seed, and it falls on the rocks and it has a shallow ground, and as soon as the sun comes out, it's going to cook and wither away. But the good seed gets rooted. And it sounds like to me they weren't very rooted. The, the, the root did not take very deep before it hit a hard surface. And I feel like that's exactly what happened here. And it, didn't, it, does, and it sounds like to me, and this is what bothers me, if people were as uh, concerned about bring, getting answers as they were about getting objections, uh, we'd see a lot less people falling away from the faith. But instead, we see a lot of people who have, ooh, objection, 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 and then they don't even try to seek the fact that there are actually good answers for these things out there in the academic space. Not just talking to your pastor. Unfortunately, not a lot of pastors are very educated in, in some of these areas. I hate to say that. I am a pastor, but some of them just aren't. And I realize it's not as big popular things with pastors because they're usually worrying about shepherding and loving their flock and preaching a sermon sermon on Sunday to encourage the saints and that sort of thing. Um, but anyway, uh, they didn't enjoy worship. Okay. Now I don't believe anything was wrong with us. We simply didn't believe. And we were too afraid to admit that to ourselves. So in that sense, we have a tremendous sense of relief now. And this comes up in every conversion story of either a deconversion out or a conversion in. They always have this emotional like relief experience. Um, don't buy into that. It's simply emotional manipulation in many ways. I I just don't like that in general. I don't like a lot of emotional manipulation and things like this. And I feel like when people hear this, they get too caught up on the open thing. Oh, they're so open and genuine. And then they, they like empathize and then they fall into it themselves because they get too emotionally drawn in. So don't do that. Don't do that. It's just dangerous. It's bad. It's not smart. He goes, I'm hoping that writing the, this contributes to that relief as I've processed these thoughts and feelings over the past year or so. I've avoided writing online about matters of faith. I didn't want to pretend to believe anything I didn't believe, but I also didn't want to rock the boat. I understand that, though. Like, some people might really criticize him, like, oh, you should have jumped the boat from the boat sooner. Look, his livelihood is attached to it. Probably scared of losing everything, as he mentioned before, all his friends and family. I get it. It's a hard, it would, that would be hard. That would be difficult, but it still doesn't 
you know, I still wish he'd come back to the faith. I just, it's sad whenever you see anybody go apostate. Anyway, I'm not sure how much this will rock the boat. I don't know if this will surprise anyone, but it doesn't matter. What matters is that I finally worked up the courage to tell my story, to share my deepest truth, and that feels like freedom too. It's going to be 72 degrees here in San Diego today. The sun is shining. It's a beautiful day. No sweater needed. A little poetic ending there. Um, so I, I got to say, in this whole thing, he, you know, he brought up questions I've heard before. Uh, the Job objection was kind of new. I've never heard somebody call it as winning a bet with Satan, but maybe it's just uh, no one's really used that one on me. But it's still, I'm not seeing anything here that bankrupts Christianity. And this, uh, these stories always do this. And I feel like whenever you tell your story and you give the reasons why the big doubts, the big doubts, these are the thing. these should be your heavy hitters. And every single time I've heard someone's heavy hitters, I'm like, oh, there's actually ex easy, easy explanations for those. And not just like cooked up excuses by Christians, like actual reasons for these. Like we have it recorded reasons for these things uh, and, or just a little bit of theological thought and it doesn't take much for you to figure it out. So, anyway, John Steingard, I doubt you'll ever watch this video. Um, and if you do, I truly hope you reach out to somebody. I would even be willing to have any conversation with anyone with doubts about their faith if I'm able. But I really want to, really hope that we see you come back to the faith. And I'm going to pray that you get surrounded by people who can bring you back and show you these things and get you more sure of that great salvation so that you can, might not neglect that great salvation. So uh, anyhow, there's a lot of reasons I think why people leave, uh, leave the church and stop believing in God. One of the biggest objections I hear regularly is the problem of evil. You know, why does evil exist? All that. Uh, I also think another one is the whole idea of, uh, of you know, spiritual authorship or, uh, if you will, scriptural inspiration or inerrancy. I hear these things all the time. Uh, legalism can be a big one. But also, this is just a general overall issue with non-biblical Christianity. A lot of his objections were things that were like, okay, these should have been answered in Bible classes, but also some of the things that were happening around you, like, Holy Spirit, fill this place, and that, that kind of reaction. These aren't things we see in the Bible. And so, because you don't see these things in the Bible, uh, it can sometimes set people off a little bit because it just seems weird. And it is weird because it's actually not something that they ever did in, Christian, in Christianity. They prayed just genuine prayers to the Lord. Uh, in fact, if you look up, you can find a lot of beautiful Hebrew prayers, um, but you don't get the sense of what people do now with that sort of thing. So... Anyway, I hope this was helpful for some of you. I just wanted to comment as I read along because some of those things that he went and talked about were like, wow, these have been addressed so many times. So I would encourage reading up, if you want, about the atonement, uh, that, you know, why did Jesus have to die? And then on top of that, I would totally encourage read, is God a moral monster? That addresses a lot of his Old Testament questions. He doesn't talk about Job in that one, but Job tells his own story. Job didn't get the answer he wanted either, but he only had one stroke of that entire canvas. And same with you and with me. But, you know, it's funny, sometimes you, life turns around a little bit and you get to see a little bit of a smidgen of the rest of that canvas. There's been many times I've suffered through many things in life. But one of the coolest things about it is going, I only saw those two miserable strokes, and then a little bit later, I saw a little bit more of the painting uh, as I looked back and went, oh, God, that's what you were doing. Uh, that's amazing. I appreciate it. Okay, I get it now. There's a bigger picture at play. I don't see the full thing, but I'm getting it that you're at work. And I think a lot of people can attest to that. Uh, the church split, this very thing that I do as a fun hobby to talk to you wonderful people, that was how this started, was through a series of major trials in my wife's and mine's life. And it decided to, you know what? I need to bring answers out there and talk to people about it. So I started the church split. It was poetic because it was things I was going through in my own life. So anyway, uh, point is, guys, don't let the, don't look up to these people like they're they're the icons of your faith. They're not. Jesus Christ is. His word is. And let's get biblical and let's get reasonable and let's start finding proper biblical ways to get apologetics and good doctrinal teaching back in churches and back in conferences and stop always focusing on just fluff and good feelings, because I'm seeing that a lot in Christianity today. That or legalism. It's like there's one, either one of the two spectrums, either too many rules or not enough, I don't know, or too much focus on, on 
these weird issues and not enough focus on other weird issues. It's like, I don't understand why there can't be a good balance of Christianity. But anyhow, thank you guys for tuning in. This is a lengthy video. Uh, and Or for those of you who are now listening on audio, I do have everything up now on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, I should be on Google by now. But if I'm not on Google Podcasts, I should be any second now. I'm waiting for that to go through. But anyway, thank you guys. If you have any questions, please send them in. And my name is Will, and this has been The Church Split.